This, uh, my husband John is still laughing about the great. <laughs> I'd like to tell you just a little bit about Gore Associates. Um, all of our associates are very proud to be sponsoring the festival this year, and especially our keynote speaker. Uh, I think that you'll get a real thrill when he comes up, and I know I'm not going to say too much. Our uh, engineers and scientists at Gore, both locally in Flagstaff and globally, are changing the world with creativity, an incredible drive to make the world a better place through the application of science and technology. Our associate team and a group is uh, here in Flagstaff is 2,000. 300 strong, which is quite a few people when you consider the size of the town. And we have another 1,000 in Phoenix, and worldwide we have 10,000 associates. Our team is genu genuinely curious, and they're deeply imaginative. Gore's Arizona operation innovates and makes imp life-improving and life-saving devices. In the last 40, 40 years, more than 45 million Gore medical devices have been implanted in patients around the world. Gore believes that together we are improving life. And as for our theme here tonight, to the moon and beyond, I also want to share how much Gore, uh, how much gore there is uh, in the moon, <laughs> or went to the moon, I'm sorry. Uh, we, <laughs> we have a variety of different uh, different products that have been used in the spacecraft and in the spacesuits themselves. I remember the Apollo 11 flight very well, and I remember hearing Charlie Duke's calm voice. Over the past 50 years plus, Gore has been a part of more than 100 space flight programs. Our products perform in environments where failure is not an option, and because of this, they are relied on time and time again. I'd like to introduce a video that fe features my younger sister, Betty, Betty Snyder, and tells you more about this exciting company history. This video was produced by the Delaware Humanities, where our company headquarters is located. I don't have the video button. <laughs> Remember what happened in July of 69? I think we went to the moon. That must have been our prom. Could have been, no, it was after the prom. Nah, not that I could recall. You talking about the moon shot? The year the Mets won the World Series, and I was in high school then, and the nuns brought TVs into every single classroom for a week. Other than that, yes, I do remember the landing on the moon. That's one small step for man. On July 20, 1969, astronaut Neil Armstrong stepped down onto another world. Back on Earth, 600 million people viewed this moment, enshrining this giant leap in mankind's history. Yet behind that first step were many dedicated people, including those working at W.L. Gore & Associates, one of three Delaware companies vital to the success of America's Apollo 11 mission. The material set that my parents started the business with lent itself to space applications. So this is a material that solved lots of problems all in one package. Gore's first product was Multitet, a flat, flexible ribbon cable containing numerous conductors, insulated and encased in a covering of PTFE. So this would connect one component of the, of the spaceship to another. So it was uh, a natural that this would be a great so, you know, product for aerospace. AT&T recognized this early in 1962 and installed Gore's wire and cable products in Telstar, the world's first communication satellite. Telstar was really exciting. Uh, I remember looking up in the sky and you could really see it. You know, and to think that we had something in there, it was just fantastic. It was beyond dreams that, uh, that our family could help do that and all, all the associates who helped as well. Over the next seven years, 
innovative designs and a proven aerospace track record resulted in NASA using many Gore products. By July 69 and the moon launch, the company's contribution to the Apollo 11 mission was significant. The ground support systems had our connectors in them. The main spacecraft had it. The lunar lander had it. The shovel for gathering rocks had it. The seismograph to measure moonquake type movements. It was just many, many places. Uh, but we were pretty confident, I would say. Nonetheless, the Gore Associates, like millions around the world, could only watch as the drama of the eight-day mission unfolded. We were glued to the TV. And everybody was. I mean, we're just holding our breath for, for all that time and just cheering them on. What courageous people and what fantastic support for this mission. Now, 50 years later, Gore continues to equip NASA's manned and unmanned spacecraft. It has become a world-class enterprise with thousands of associates and a diverse product portfolio. A true Delaware success story. Yet, its journey from modest beginnings to global success will always be tied to America's greatest journey and the wonder that surrounds it. It was a dream come true for my parents. Unbelievable that they could start this little business in the downstairs in the basement, and almost 10 years later, it would be on the moon. Unbelievable. That always inspires me um, when I see it. It reminds me of many things that were going on in Delaware in those early days. Uh, many of the wires and cables used in the mis mission were actually manufactured here in Flagstaff in those early days and were part of the equipment that transported our, our astronauts to the moon. They helped gather data about the rocky surface and helped the crew navigate home. They worked with the seismograph equipment that was connected to the lunar lander with Gore installed flat cable during the Apollo 11 mission. Gore products are also part of the ground support equipment, tracking radar, computers, and conductors. My story is from my perspective here on Earth, but now I'm excited to have you hear another perspective that of an experience of more than 238,000 miles away in space. Now, let me prepare you for our featured guest. Apollo 16 astronaut General Charlie Duke made history as the 10th and youngest man to walk on the moon. He was 36 years old during the 1972 moon landing. Charlie was born in Charlotte, North Carolina, and grew up in Lancaster, South Carolina. He graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy, earned his master's degree in aeronautics and astronautics from MIT. In 1965, he graduated from the U.S. Air Force Test Pilot School, which put him on track for a career as an astronaut. You may not have met him, but you may well have heard his voice. On Ju uh, July 20th in 1969, Charlie was a communications link to the mission control of the Apollo 11 astronauts floating above the lunar surface, preparing for the first moon landing. The mission was in critical danger of running out of fuel and aborting the landing. Charlie's calm, clear voice was heard calling out mere seconds that the craft had left. With only 17 seconds to go, he received confirmation that the eagle had landed. Charlie's, Charlie Duke's response was quite possibly one of the most famous quotes you will hear from the space program. Roger, Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You've got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. You would think that that would be enough excitement for a lifetime, but three years later, Charlie Duke went to the moon himself. Please give a warm welcome to pioneering space explorer and American hero, General Charlie Duke.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What a great pleasure it is uh, for me uh, and my wife Dorothy to uh, return to Flagstaff. Our first visit here was uh, on our way from MIT uh, to uh, Edwards Air Force Base when this was 1964 uh, when we were, uh, I'd graduated from MIT. Well, first off, I wanna say thank you uh, to the uh, Flagstaff Festival of Science for inviting me uh, and uh, to welcome me back to uh, uh, the, uh, this, this great city uh, and this great place to learn geology. Uh, I knew nothing about geology. And uh, so when we got here uh, later on, when I got selected, uh, as an astronaut, there were 3,500 of us uh, applied uh, for the uh, fifth group, and there were 19 of us selected. Tonight, uh, we have in the audience also the group from 2017 that was selected. Uh, there were 12 of them tonight. They're here with uh, their uh, trainers, uh, and I'd like to uh, have them stand up and uh, introduce them, uh, show themselves, so just wave to you if we can see. There they are. Yeah. Well, uh, there were 12 of them were selected. They had 18,000 applications. So you know they're talented. <laughs> I don't think I would have made the first cut uh, in, in uh, that selection process. So, uh, <clears throat> Flagstaff is a really special place for me because that's where we began to learn geology. You know, the whole purpose of going to the moon is picking up rocks, uh, at least it was back in my day, and do a little science along with it. And as a fighter pilot, yeah, that's a rock and that's a piece of dirt, but uh, uh, that's my, about my knowledge of it. Well, uh, throughout uh, six years of training from the time I started until I flew, Apollo 16, uh, I got an equivalent of a master's degree in geology. And I tell the audience, now I don't really mean this, this is sort of a, a joke, but when I got to the moon, I remembered lesson number one in geology, and that's pick up one of every color. <laughs> <laughs> and on the moon we had white ones, black ones, and gray ones, that was about it. <laughs> but there was a lot of variety in those rocks, and so thankfully the training that we got uh, through the great uh, geologists and all uh, was uh, very, very uh, a good training. And when we started describing the rocks that uh, we were finding up on Apollo uh, 16, they were very excited because they were unique. Uh, the rocks that had been brought back before were not the same, exactly the same. So anyway, uh, it, my geology training was a great part of my training. Uh, and. Uh, also, uh, you might be interested, you heard the biography. Uh, back when I graduated from the Naval Academy, there, there wasn't any Air Force Academy. So you could volunteer for the Air Force from West Point and Annapolis. And I fell in love with airplanes when I was at, at, at the Naval Academy. And so uh, I decided, well, I've got a choice, Naval Aviation or Air Force. What do you want to do? And uh, so that decision was made for me. My, my senior year, I got a physical, and the doctor said, Mitch and Duke, you have an astigmatism in your right eye, and you don't qualify for naval aviation, but the Air Force will take you. <laughs> <laughs> and so I ended up raising my hand, sworn in as a second lieutenant. And that's uh, 1957, and I can't tell you how many physicals I've experienced in th that time. I'm still going back to NASA for a physical. 
They call it the longitudinal, longitudinal study of astronaut health. And so we show up once a year and they give us uh, a physical. And, uh, and, and so I'm still getting physicals, but the point is in all of those physicals, since 1957, nobody has seen an, an astigmatism in my right eye except this guy. <laughs> So it was a sort of, thank you, Lord, I'm in the Air Force. And uh, it was a really a good, uh, a good experience uh, for me. I spent uh, 29 years active in reserve. And uh, in Apollo, there were nine missions to the moon. And I, got, I was very fortunate. I got to work on five of those nine missions. I was in uh, support crew for Apollo 10 and mission control as Capcom. And that team that... Uh, guided the lunar module down almost to touchdown uh, on Apollo 10 uh, was asked by Neil Armstrong. Of course, we went over to Apollo 11 and I went over as Capcom and, and was there in mission control when uh, Neil and Buzz landed on the moon. It was a very, very uh, exciting moment. Uh, I was probably ner more nervous uh, in mission control than I was when I landed on the moon almost three years later. And the reason was, you look in mission control, you're just looking at the data. And there's no visual cues. The crew's got everything, the, 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 the data and the visual cues. And so as we were coming in on Apollo 11, we're, we had them targeted into the wrong place and they were flying over this uh, rough lunar terrain and Neil had to level off and fly, I don't know, three or four miles, whatever it was, then pitch up the vehicle to stop his forward velocity and then start down. Well, that took a lot of extra gas. And so now we're minimum fuel. And uh, we had a fuel budget that if you got to 4%, I think it was, we called 60 seconds. That means he had 60 seconds to land. Then I called 30 seconds and he still wasn't on the ground, but they were close. And, uh, and so 13 seconds later, according to my watch, uh, I heard contact, engine stop, and it, it, the tension was just amazing. And it just sort of all evaporated because they made it, they're on the ground. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, Neil very calmly said, uh, Houston Tranquility Base here, the Eagle has landed. And I had to respond, and I was so excited, it came out, Roger Twang, uh, <laughs> tranquility, we copy you on the ground, you got a bunch of guys about to turn blue, we're breathing again. And so uh, that was, uh, then from there, I went to backup crew on Apollo 13. I spent a lot of time in mission control uh, after the explosion, of course. Uh, but. Apollo 11, Apollo 13, Apollo 10, every flight had a problem. And mission control was the heroes of Apollo, the unsung heroes of Apollo. And I think still today, thanks to the mission control team, well-trained, uh, we were able to recover Apollo 13 crew. Without the mission control, they would never have made it. Without mission control, I'd have never landed on the moon. Without mission control, I doubt Apollo 11 would have landed on the moon because uh, we, gave, we kept, gave him a go. And so I think it, at the end of uh, that 60 seconds, if I said uh, uh, eagle abort, uh, it would have been sort of dead silence. And it would have been, say again, Houston, we don't read you. And Neil Armstrong was gonna land that vehicle. He was within 50 feet of the moon when he got to, I think when we had the 60 seconds call. And he knew he could use that reserve fuel for an abort to land. Now if he was 3,000 feet up, he couldn't do it. But at 50 feet, he could do it. But fortunately, we never had to do it. So uh, John and I ended up working on Apollo, back up on Apollo 13, John Young. Uh, and uh, we ended up flying uh, on Apollo 16 which was supposed to be the first uh, mission with the rover, uh, the little electric car we had. But they canceled the last three missions in Apollo and moved the rover up one, and so we were the second with the rover. 
Uh, it was very, very exciting. The training was uh, demanding. Uh, it's, I, don't, I wouldn't call the, uh, an astronaut uh, in training an easy job. You know, if, just for instance, you watch the astronauts up there on the space station, they go outside and do EVAs, and they do, and they, man, that looks easy. That looks fun to do. Or you're repairing the Hubble telescope outside. And it looks easy as we watch it, but nobody sees the 500 hours that they spent in the water tank learning how to do that in space. And so it's a, it's, it's a hard job, uh, but everybody stays focused. I talk to the young people, I say, you know, in your career or in your school, stay focused. Prepare, keep your antennas up, prepare to go this way, that way, or this way in your, in your career. When I was a little kid growing up in South Carolina, a little town of Lancaster, about 8,000 people, uh, there wasn't any space program. Now, so I, at 12 years old, I did not go out in the backyard and say, Mama, I'm going to walk on the moon. I'd have probably ended up in a psychiatric hospital. <laughs> and so, but I, as I said, fell in love with airplanes. And so that led me uh, to the Naval Academy, hoping to be a midshipman and a, uh, a naval officer. But then the Air Force opportunities came along. And so here I, I stand as a retired Air Force guy and as a retired astronaut. And it's, uh, this year has been very, very busy. And I'm so excited about the, uh, uh, the uh, enthusiasm and the attention that people all over the world have been giving to, uh, uh, to Apollo this year. Uh, it's been almost nonstop for all of us that are still available to travel uh, in Apollo. We're all in our 80s now, and there are only four of us left alive of the 12 that walked on the moon. So we want to be a good representative of our country and of our space program. And so we're doubling up, if you will, to get out and tell the story and to say thank you for all your support uh, of, uh, of Apollo. It, may, it sort of looked like a world event, but it was the United States of America that 400,000 people that worked and, and did it in eight and a half years. I was a young lieutenant in Germany as a fighter pilot, uh, fighter interceptor pilot, when uh, uh, Alan Shepard went up, second man in space. Yuri Gagarin, the Russian, was the first. That was in April and, of, and early May of 1961. About two weeks later, Kennedy announced, we're going to go to the moon. Well, I mean, everybody in my squadron laughed at him. Hoo-ha, yeah, we got 15 minutes in space, and you're going to send us to the moon. The most amazing thing about it for me was eight years and two months later, we did it. And it was 400,000 people, seven days a week, three shifts a day, getting that spacecraft ready. In spite of all the accidents, we had eight, eight astronauts killed over that uh, early in the program, uh, four in airplane accidents, Apollo 1 crew killed at uh, Kennedy Space Center in the spacecraft, and then another, uh, uh, another automobile accident. And so we were, it was a tough time in the astronaut office, and uh, it looked like we were dead in the water. But everybody started working. We're going to do this. We're going to get it done by the end of 1969. And that was the, mo the, the uh, not Modi, but that was the, the work that we, that was the goal, I should say, that we were going to do it because that's what President Kennedy wanted the um, U.S. to do. And fortunately, we did it. So uh, I had uh, training was uh, not only geology, but spacesuits and uh, uh, simulators. Uh, I had 2,000 hours in a simulator over Apollo 13, 16, and 17. And I probably crashed on the moon 1,000 times. <laughs> but I landed 3,000 times. So we knew how to do it. <laughs> So I want to, I've got some slides here. I want to just briefly go through this. Uh, and uh, of course, every Apollo patch 
Uh, this, this was our patch. Uh, we had the idea, but we had a graphic guy, uh, uh, a gal do it, and we had our names on it. Well, on every Apollo patch, the crew's name was on it except for Apollo 11. And Neil Armstrong, it's not my mission, it's the U.S.'s mission. We don't need our names on the patch. And so he, they refused to put their names on the patch, but everybody else had such an ego, we want our names on a patch. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, everybody else had their names on a patch. Uh, let's see if I can get this thing. Uh, this is our crew. John Young is in the middle. He was a uh, senior astronaut. Uh, Ken Mattingly, or TK, is on the left. I'm on the right. And uh, uh, John was the only uh, one with any experience. He had flown uh, uh, two Geminis. This was his second Apollo flight. And he, he ended up uh, flying two shuttle flights. The only astronauts flown three different kind of spacecraft. And he started in 1961, and I think he retired like 1995. So he was the longest serving one. Uh, and uh, so that was our crew. John and I landed on the moon while TK uh, did, the, uh, 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 did the orbital in the command module. Uh, this is the Saturn, uh, let's see if I can get this thing on. Yeah, this is the Saturn rocket. Uh, it doesn't look very big, but it's the biggest one ever flown. Uh, it was uh, 33 feet in diameter, uh, weighed six and, a, and it was 363 feet tall, and uh, weighed six and a half million pounds, fully fueled, ready for liftoff. Uh, it had five engines at the base, uh, pushing with, um, uh, here we go, pushing with seven and a half million pounds of thrust. So you had seven and a half million pushing six and a half million. So the acceleration wasn't very fast, but the vibration from side to side was really intense. Uh, you're at the top up here. Uh, let's see, you're at the top up here and the engines are moving down here. And so it's 360 feet. And when it gets up to you, the vibration is intense. And in Apollo, the windows were covered over so you couldn't see outside And <clears throat> at this point. And uh, so, uh, I didn't remember anybody telling me it was supposed to shake like that. So, <laughs> I, you know, my first ride, and I got, I got a little excited. And so when I got back, I, we had, you know, heart monitors and everything on. And, and so I asked the flight uh, surgeon when I got back, I said, uh, uh, what was my heartbeat uh, at liftoff? He said, you're excited. I said, yeah, I know that, but what was my heartbeat? <laughs> he said, yours was 140 at liftoff. And I said, well, what was John's? Oh, his was 70. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you can see who the cool one was in in our, uh, in our, uh, in our flight, uh, in our crew, rather. Okay, uh, this is a picture of the Earth that I took. Uh, and we were about 20,000 miles away, and uh, the Arctic, uh, here we go, the Arctic Circle's up here. Uh, here's California, uh, right here, and the uh, Baja, uh, the Rocky Mountains, uh, Arizona's right down in here somewhere, Texas is down in here, and in uh, Florida over here, and uh, Mexico, Central, uh, the, the Yucatan, uh, and the Pacific Ocean. Uh, we were going south, uh, we'd left orbit over Australia, and we were going south towards the equator. And the picture actually was turned sideways, and it looked like California was at the bottom. Uh, it was spectacular. And you could see the colors of the, moon, of the earth was white, brown, and, and blue. And there, uh, the jewel of earth was just suspended in the blackness of space. And everywhere else you looked, except for the moon and the sun, is just black. Sun shining all the time. If you think about it, you're, the Earth Apollo trajectory from the once you left Earth orbit till you got to the moon was always daylight, and that was 72 hours of daylight. And so you look out and you just see the blackness of space. You can't see uh, any of the stars uh, while you're on uh, out in deep space. And uh, uh, to my friends sitting out there in the audience, when you go to if you go to Mars, you're going to have what, six months of darkness, I mean daylight uh, out there. And uh, so 
how do you tell time? Uh, how do you keep time in space? Well, in Apollo, you had a clock that started at liftoff. It's called ground elapsed time. It counted one hour, two hours, three hours, four hours. And so uh, your flight plan was based on that clock, no matter what time it was in Houston or what time it was in London. And uh, so as you went out, you just did your procedures and all the meals and all the sleeping and all the house cleaning. Everything was based on that clock. <clears throat> this is a, a view of the, uh, the moon, uh, just a map of the moon, but to show you, here we uh, are, 16, is the farther south. This is the center of the moon, latitude and latitude right here. Apollo 11 was in tranquility here, uh, so we were southwest of, uh, of him. He was just about on the equator. The farthest west was Apollo 12, then Apollo 14 at Frau Morrow. The farthest north was Apollo 15 uh, in uh, Taurus Littro. No, this is 17 Taurus Littro. This was Hadley Rill. And uh, so uh, farthest north, farthest east, uh, and we all landed on the uh, front side of the moon because the mission rule was you're not landing on the back because we can't talk to you back there. Uh, and so uh, we all had to land on the front side so we, our landings could be monitored by uh, mission control. Uh, the lunar module was a great machine. It didn't look like a flying machine. It wasn't meant to fly except in space. Uh, and it would not re-enter. You had no heat shield. So the lunar module uh, was uh, uh, a, a lunar vehicle, if you will. Here is the door that we uh, opened when we got outside. We were looking out of these two windows. Uh, these long probes here were electrical probes, and when they touched the moon, it turned on a light inside. Uh, it said contact, and you shut the engine down when that light came on. And so you dropped in the last uh, uh, four feet or so. Uh, the descent engine is here. Uh, the descent stage, you used it as a launch platform. Uh, and also, I might add that right here uh, is the car. Uh, was folded up in a five by five space right here that we deployed once we landed on the moon. Uh, this is a view look of our landing site looking to the south. Uh, this is uh, called Stone Mountain. It's about four miles away. And this is looking out of John's uh, uh, window. Uh, and on the second EVA, we drove the car up into this position up here uh, to have uh, our um, <clears throat> uh, uh, most spectacular view of our landing site was up on the side of that mountain. Uh, <clears throat> then we had uh, a picture out of looking to the, to the west you land, all Apollo landed facing, uh, facing west. So that, the sun was in the early morning of the moon, and so you gave you long shadows uh, out there so that when you landed, you could see the craters, the rocks, and stuff like that, and the, and the slope of the terrain. If the moon was tilted towards you, it was bright gray. If it was tilted away from you, it was dark gray. Uh, here's a crater back out here called Southway Crater. It was about eight miles away, and we couldn't get there. But when that crater, that meteor hit there, it blasted stuff into our landing site, and those were the white rocks that uh, we collected. Uh, here I am saluting the flag, uh, the ritual. Uh, people don't believe we landed uh, on the moon uh, because uh, there's no stars in the sky, and uh, the flag's waving, and there's no atmosphere on the moon. Well, the flag's held out by a curtain rod, uh, and it was vacuum packed for three, six months, and I couldn't get the wrinkles out of it. <laughs> and so if you look at the picture that I took 72 hours later, it's the same wrinkles. So uh, here's our car. Uh, we, we practiced with one called the Grover, uh, which was developed here in Flagstaff. Uh, and this vehicle would not work, uh, would not work on the moon, I mean, uh, would not work on Earth because the suspension system was weighed for lunar gravity. Uh, this is the back end, of course, uh, with all the geology trip uh, tools. Uh, I'm sitting in this seat, John Young is the driver, 
uh, and I'm using a set of maps up here uh, to navigate us. I was the navigator. Uh, behind the maps, uh, well, right in here is the uh, instrument panel, uh, TV camera. Uh, John is adjusting the antenna. So when we stopped, we turned on the camera, pointed it up at Earth, uh, and uh, got a TV. And from then on, the camera was controlled by an engineer in mission control. Uh, just another view of what the limb looks like on the lunar surface. You can't tell it, but right back here, about two yards back, six feet, there was a crater we missed by six feet. If we'd have landed six feet back, the vehicle would have been tipped up. I don't think it would have turned over, but it would have been picked, tipped up, and that would have meant I was down too low to get the experiments package off at this point. Uh, so, uh, uh, but fortunately, John missed it, and uh, so we had a, a good EVA. Uh, here I am on the uh, west of the lunar module. Uh, John's taking my picture, uh, and uh, so I'm, uh, if you notice this crater, it's called Plum Crater, and it was about uh, 40 uh, yards wide and maybe 50 feet deep. And you look at the footprints back here, we gave it a wide berth because if you sloughed into that, you couldn't get out. Uh, just to the left, uh, there's a sequence of a panorama, and uh, just to the left is a Flag Crater, and that's named for Flagstaff. So, uh, as I said earlier tonight, uh, uh, we were told we could not name uh, craters after things that would recognize, like Flagstaff. So I wanted to name a crater for my wife, Dottie, so I called it Dot Crater. And uh, then I had one for my two kids, Charles and Tom, that became Cat Crater. Uh, and so all of, and, uh, all of the craters we named uh, for uh, familiar objects to us and so our geologists who were on, in mission control, they knew, hey, we're standing on the edge of Plum Crater. They knew exactly where we were. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, let's see here, next one here. Uh, just us uh, doing lunar samples, sampling. Uh, we collected 213 pounds of moon rocks. Uh, we took photographs of every sample with these little cameras here. Uh, Hasselblad. We had a shovel, uh, a rake. Here's a rake. We had a shovel and we had some tongs. Uh, this is uh, the, up on top of Stone Mountain and the last one I want to show you because I want to shift to a video. Uh-oh. Uh wait a minute. Uh, backwards. Here we go. Well, let's see. There we go. Well, uh, the lunar module... Oh, shoot. There we go. The lunar module is back out over here. Uh, and we're about 300 feet above the valley floor. Uh, our, uh, uh, another objective was cross the valley over here called Northway Crater. And what a spectacular view. You can see the rover tracks went over this rock. And uh, John, it was really rough up there. It's the only level spot we found up on that mountain. So if we could shift to the video now, if you could, uh, this video, I will narrate, uh, it's not, uh, it's, got, it's silent. It's 14 minutes from liftoff to splashdown. Uh, and it uh, comes from a, of course, NASA film, but uh, I put all this together. Here's the ignition on the uh, Saturn V. Uh, never had a failure on the Saturn. There were four big clamps, here's two, uh, that held the engine, the vehicle down onto the pad till all the engines were running, which took about eight seconds uh, to get that done. The white stuff uh, falling off is, uh, is ice. Uh, the, the vehicle, we had about two tons of ice, we estimate, but the vibration of the vehicle shook, shook the uh, ice off within the first uh, uh, few seconds. The first stage of the vehicle was from here down, uh, and uh, for us, it lasted for two minutes and 41 seconds. It was a, a G-level shutdown. It's not a 
fuel depletion. Rocket engines don't like fuel depletion because they get unstable and can blow up. Uh, so uh, uh, we went through the only cloud in the sky. Uh, <laughs> And off we go. We accelerated to a maximum four and a half times gravity uh, during the first stage. Uh, and during that first stage, two minutes and 41 seconds, we burned up four million pounds of fuel. So well over half the weight of the vehicle was gone uh, on the uh, first stage. When it shut down, it, you went from four and a half Gs to zero instantly. And uh, even though you strapped in real tightly, it, was, it felt like a train wreck. <clears throat> so you'll see the separation here in just a second. There it goes, the first stage falling away. You can imagine the explosive charge it took to separate a 33-inch diam 33-foot diameter uh, piece of rocket from the upper stage. Uh, at, from Earth, there was a, a long duration, uh, a long distance camera uh, that took uh, the picture and this is what it looked like. The windows are still uncovered, uh, I mean covered, so we didn't see this. Uh, you see the uh, interstage, the Atlantic Ocean, uh, the clouds, and Florida's back over in here somewhere. Uh, and uh, so we were in orbit for one and a half revolutions. Uh, then we uh, left for the, for the moon, as I was telling you. This is that picture again, but this is what it looked like. Uh, uh, we're going this way, and so uh, the U.S. looked like it was on its end with California down here. Uh, and uh, that what a beautiful sight. It's indelibly uh, in my mind. Uh, this is the inside of the uh, uh, command module. Uh, it, uh, not much volume in that vehicle, so there were three of us, and we took our suits off, and that's six of us. And so we had to get everything stowed. A zero gravity, this is something just for mainly people that don't know about zero gravity, but you can't keep anything still. Everything floats around. Uh, and that's a spoon, a pencil, and we had a flashlight that we tried to get steady. Uh, this one right here, but it never did. Now I'm on one side of the spacecraft, Mattingly was on the other, and John was in the middle. So uh, we had mostly dehydrated food. It came in little plastic bags. This is a space shuttle uh, photograph, not up from us. Uh, it's Pinky Nelson, there's the astronaut, and it shows you what liquid does in space. It takes the shape of the sphere. And then we had a flying banana. Uh, <laughs> and I think that's Kurt Brown, but I'm not sure. That's another spatel, space shuttle. We didn't have any uh, bananas either, uh, but we had grape juice. Uh, the, the food wasn't very, didn't look very taste, uh, very appetizing, but it wasn't bad on Apollo. Except on the moon, we didn't have any hot water, uh, so we ate uh, cold food for three days, which didn't bother you at all. You were so excited. Uh, here's another view of that uh, vehicle as we pitch uh, down, uh, or pitch up to us, uh, and the hatch is here. From the hatch to the foot pad is about 15 feet. The vehicle here at this point weighed about 39,000 pounds. We used 19,000 pounds of fuel in the descent engine to land. Left Mattingly in orbit, uh, and uh, we started down from a eight, an altitude of eight miles above the moon. Took, if I remember, about 12 minutes uh, to come down. But before we did this, uh, we had to rendezvous again because he reported a problem in his spacecraft. And that problem was so bad that we didn't think we'd get to land. But mission control to the rescue, and they gave us a go for landing after six hours. This crate, these big craters were 500 meters in diameter. We recognized those. But these little ones, we didn't see until we got close. And you see the shadow come in and the dust uh, being blown away by the uh, descent exhaust. Uh, and we're about 10% power at this point. Uh, John levels off and then sits down and boom. And the instant you cut the, the engine off, the dust flew away and no more dust. The moon is covered with very fine dust like powder, uh, which is basically pulverized rock. Uh, and uh, uh, all the, the craters, are media, media craters are either impact craters uh, from 
big rocks getting blown out and then scattered across the moon. So here's a rock right in here that's uh, in that little crater. Uh, here I am putting a, we didn't have digital cameras back then, so we had to put film on the camera. Well, there's a, uh, dust on that camera, so <laughs> I'm blowing the dust off. <laughs> When I realized what I was doing, I you idiot, it just not, that's <laughs> not, not going to work. Uh, so, uh, uh, so we put the flag up, uh, and uh, the wrinkles I've explained, here I am. The TV's on the, ca on the car taking our, our pictures, so John comes uh, uh, coming out. Now, I was telling the, the, the ballet troupe back, what is it like? Walking on the moon, it's like walking on a trampoline down here. Uh, because down here, I weighed a 363 pounds, up on the moon, only 60 pounds. Uh, so you, you, like John, you could bounce a lot. But now, here come, this is me, and this is my most embarrassing moment in the whole <laughs> Apollo uh, 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 16 mission. John's working on a camera. Well, I, on my right side here, I'm carrying... $10 million worth of moon experiments. And on my left side is the uh, batteries. <laughs> Golly, they fell off. <laughs> well, I was really embarrassed, and I looked to see if the TV camera was looking at me. <laughs> but I had to fess up. They saw it. <laughs> but it, it didn't matter. The, the experience, in one six gravity, they weren't uh, damaged. So you can see the, uh, the footprints as, as John kicks up the dust, and since there's no atmosphere, it doesn't swirl around. Uh, we had a lot of experiments. We had a heat flow experiment. I had to drill uh, two holes into the moon. We had uh, two seismic experiments. Uh, we had a mass spectrometer experiment. We had magnetics experiments. We had penetrometers. Uh, we had a lot of different uh, experiments. The last three missions of Apollo were basically science. And this is the camera, the movie picture I took of the rover. And it's the only uh, sequence of the rover underway where you got to see the whole thing. And you can see how it bounces around. And riding it, this is what it looks like. You got your seatbelt on, but you better be, uh, uh, be ready for a rough ride. So... <laughs> Guess what? That's me. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, so that penetrometer went in, so now you got to get up. So uh, this is the sequence of getting up. <laughs> I'm up. <sighs> well, this is an earlier sequence because we're not quite as dirty. Uh, the moon dust, you could not brush it off. And when you kicked it up, it kept stuck to your, your suit. And when you brushed it off, it just didn't come off. So uh, the white suits uh, became gray. Uh, and I was briefing the new group here uh, back in Houston. And I said, one of the things that really was troubling was the, the dust you track into the spacecraft. And here I am trying to do this by myself. <laughs> We normally collected rocks together, as we saw a minute ago. Well, I can't tell you why I wanted that rock, but <laughs> now 47 years later, but I wanted that rock. And I, so I grabbed the rock, but I dropped the bag I was putting it in. <laughs> but we had lots of bags. And uh, one of the bigger rocks uh, on the moon, but not the biggest we saw. The biggest was uh, probably 45, no, about 70 feet across and about 30 feet high. And, uh, it, and you're looking at the mountains on the north of us. Uh, these were too far away uh, to get to. We left the car, uh, now, that, now this is my scariest moment. Uh, I'm setting a high jump record on the moon. John's here and here I go over backwards. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, over backwards was scary because that backpack is just carbon fiber and it's got everything back there, your electrical systems, your uh, cooling, your oxygen, your plumbing, 
you have regulators, and if it breaks, you're dead. Uh, so uh, I had to break my fall. I rolled right, broke my fall, and John came over and says, that wasn't very smart, Charlie. And, <laughs> and I said, you're right, help me up. Uh, well, I left a picture of my family up on the moon. Our boys were uh, five and seven at the time, and, uh, and this was uh, uh, very special to us. I'll explain later if I have a time. But here we go. Uh, actually, this is 17. But I picked this because the camera followed it up the father's. Ours, boop, we had disappeared. The, the camera on the car, we left the car running, not running, but we left it powered up. <laughs> Uh, and the camera, and so he had to start the camera up, and it's a one and a half second delay from Earth to the moon till the command gets there. We rendezvous after an hour. Uh, this is 30 times faster than it happened. Uh, and that would really scare you trying to rendezvous at that uh, speed. But uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, here's reentry. Uh, we hit the atmosphere at uh, 26,000 miles an hour. Uh, and you had a fireball outside, and you can see the black space, and now we start to roll around to control our landing spot. The Apollo had no wings, but it had lift because the center of gravity wasn't at the center of the heat shield. So it, it, you could come in like an airplane, lift up, or you could roll over and lift down, or right or left, and you could steer, the autopilot could steer it depending on where it pointed the lift vector. Uh, and so at about 100,000 feet, we're basically free fall. Uh, and uh, at 23,000 feet, uh, there were two parachutes came out called the drogue chutes. And their purpose was to get you falling down so the parachutes were up and the heat shield was down. Uh, uh, <clears throat> because it was probably unsafe to try to deploy the parachutes when they were below the heat shield. And so this was at 23,000 feet. At 10,000 feet, the parachutes came out uh, and the main chutes, and there were three of them. And to, this was a beautiful sight to see the parachutes uh, because an 11-day mission can end in disaster without the parachutes. But we were right on track, target, I should say. Here's a helicopter. A helicopter's taking our picture here, and we're talking to the ship, the Ticonderoga, uh, this is in the South Pacific, uh, uh, quite a way south of Hawaii. Uh, on Apollo, we called it splashdown, but you really hit hard, and it was really crashed down. Uh, and, uh, uh, and this parachute stayed inflated and flipped us over upside down, and that put the hatch underwater. So the Apollo would float right side up or upside down, and to get it back up again, we had uh, special uh, balloons on the top, which was now the bottom, and we just pumped up these balloons and it flipped us back over and uh, we were uh, safe. Uh, and uh, by the way, that's the big rock I'm telling you about. It's about a, half, a quarter of a mile and that's the house rock, we call house rock right back there. And that's John Young. You could always tell the commander in Apollo because the red stripes. Uh, he had red stripe down his hat across the arms, across the arms here and down around the legs. Uh, so uh, mission complete on Apollo. Uh, and uh, I got back and uh, really excited uh, and wanted to go again. One more flight. Well, they needed a backup crew. So John said, we'll go. Uh, and uh, for six months of training on Apollo 6, 17, I tried to break... Uh, Harrison Smith's leg, but he wouldn't let me close to him. Uh, so uh, nobody got to go. Uh, nobody walked on the moon twice. John Young got to go to the moon twice. But he saw Apollo 10, they didn't land. Uh, Gene Cernan got to go to the uh, moon twice. And he, uh, he landed on Apollo 17 as commander. Jim Lovell went to the moon twice. Apollo 8 and Apollo 13 but he never got to land because of the problems they had on Apollo 13. We brought them back safely by just running them around the moon and back uh, to, to Earth. To me, Apollo 8, just one more comment, and then we get the lights up and we'll have some questions uh, for uh, uh, everybody. 
But uh, the, uh, to me, the, uh, the riskiest mission we flew in Apollo was Apollo 8. Uh, we, I don't remember the details, but it was not supposed to go to the moon. But a rumor or something started, the Russians were going to beat us to the moon. We got to get there. And so they, changed, they decided to change Apollo 8 from Earth orbit to lunar flight. It was the second manned mission in Apollo. And it was the second time, the first time anybody had ridden a Saturn V manned. It was the second time we'd ever flown the command module and service module. The lunar module wasn't ready, so we couldn't take the lunar module. So when those guys said, we'll go, and when they launched, we launched them to the moon, they, it had to work. There was no backup. It had to work. If it didn't work, they were either in orbit or off in space somewhere. Uh, and so, uh, so that's why I think it was probably the riskiest mission, at least in Apollo, uh, that, we ever, that we ever flew. But one of the most memorable moments, I think, on Apollo 8, uh, the older people will remember this, it was Christmas Eve, 1968, and they had a TV show from the moon, from above the moon. And as they turned on the camera, we saw Earth rise. And it was the first pictures that were taken from deep space of, a, of our Earth. And there was this jewel of Earth just suspended in the blackness of space. And they start reading from Genesis. The first 10 verses of Genesis uh, were read. And uh, then... Uh, Frank Borman, the commander, uh, finished up with uh, Godspeed, uh, Planet Earth, and Merry Christmas, everybody, and uh, they turned off the TV. So those words to me were very, very meaningful, I thought, that the fact that there we were, the whole earth world could see that Earth from the moon. And uh, so the pictures that we took on Apollo uh, are historic, of course, and we were very, very fortunate to uh, 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 have had that opportunity to go. There were 24 of us uh, that went to the moon on Apollo. As I said, three guys went twice. So 27, nine missions, that's 27 seats, three, three seats th twice, act, uh, three guys twice. So there were 24 of us got to go and 24 of us got to see that with our own eyes, uh, the earth rise. Uh, and I'm convinced uh, that we'll be back to the moon uh, soon. It's, uh, it's, we're committed to return to the moon. Uh, it, we got a vehicle that's flyable uh, that will be uh, the Orion. Uh, that be, uh, I call it Apollo on steroids, uh, but it uh, looks similar to Apollo, and it's already ready, it's been tested, not man-tested yet, man-rated yet, but it's going to be in a year or two. Uh, our present astronauts could probably holler out when the first flight's supposed to be, but I don't remember. But uh, anyway, that's ready to go. The SLS, the new rockets, is almost ready to go. And the only thing we need is a lunar module. And in Apollo, we built a lunar module in five years. And it was ready, to, not ready to go, but it was, it was there and we started testing it. So it's not a matter of technology in my mad, mind, it's a matter of budgets. And it will, will we get the money? And uh, I don't know, I can't, I'm not a fortune teller, so I can't see that far in, the, in advance. But hopefully we'll get, the, uh, uh, we'll get funded and NASA will be back on into deep space. I'm very excited about what we call commercial space. Uh, it's private, uh, uh, SpaceX, Blue Origin, uh, Virgin Galactic, uh, Boeing has got a vehicle, and it, I don't believe it'll be long before we'll have space tourism. And we'll, some of you will get to go uh, into the moon, uh, not to the moon maybe, but into orbit, and orbit the Earth, and uh, see Earth as Few people have seen it uh, from orbit. Uh, I've got a friend that's paid his money for uh, Virgin Galactic. He thinks he's going to fly next year. And there's 600 people signed up. Uh, and uh, I think as we get confidence in these spacecraft, uh, the price will come down. 
and uh, who knows how many people we'll have in Earth orbit uh, viewing the Earth. I told my friend in Virgin Galactic, he's going to have five minutes of zero gravity and come back down. I said, don't get unstrapped. Just look out the window. <laughs> That'll be the most spectacular view you'll ever have in your life, Earth from 400,000 feet. So just look out the window. Spend your five minutes looking out the window. If you want to experience zero gravity, uh, go to Bordeaux, France, and you can pay for it over there in a three tw uh, Airbus. Well, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. We, uh... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Sit down. Uh, <clears throat> We got uh, time for some questions. There are going to be microphones uh, out uh, uh, in the audience. Uh, and we'll try to take a question or two from this side, one from that side, and then maybe one or two from the balcony. I know we're supposed to be through at 9, uh, but I don't think they're going to run us out. Uh, so uh, if you've got a question, uh, I'm going to need some uh, help up here. So, uh, Bonnie, could you... Uh, would you come on up? I've got hearing aids in, and when they start talking from asking questions from the audience, say that again. But if you will interpret the question for me and, and say it, and it'd be nice to, to repeat the question so everybody might not hear it. So, do we have any questions? That uh, anybody got any micro? Do we have microphones? The okay. mics are off to the sides if you want to step up to the microphones on the edges here in the stairway. Let's see if this is on. Yeah, here's a microphone over here. So let's take this question over here. She's wearing a shirt that says tranquility on it. Oh, tranquility. Oh, yeah. Tranquility, all right. <laughs> what was on your mixtape? What was on what? Oh, your my music tape. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, we had uh, on Apollo, we each could take two hours of music. Uh, T.K. Mattingly had classical, John Lung had easy listening, and I took country music. <laughs> and, and uh, I had a disc jockey friend in Houston. I said, give me some country music. He said, you got it. And so uh, he, he said, now don't listen to this as you get airborne. And so I turned it on, and it was Porter Wagner and Dolly Parton. And he said, hi, Charlie, how you doing? And we thank you for taking us to the moon. And uh, so they did a 30 minutes of, of their show just for us. The next was Merle Haggard, 30 minutes just for us. And the next was Buck Owens just for us. And it finished off with Chet Atkins and uh, 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 Jerry Reed. And uh, I've got my neighbor uh, in New Braunfels, Texas, where we live is Randy Rogers. Uh, he's got a new album. He's a country music star. And he's got a, an album out that's, uh, and the lead song is, Charlie Duke took country music to the moon. <laughs> and, and, it's, and it's on YouTube. So, uh, okay. Over here. How long were you in, sp in space for? How long were you in space for? Uh, we were in space. Uh, we were scheduled for 12 days. But since the, we had a real problem in the command module, they changed our flight plan to only 11 days. We, were, uh, we spent five days, Mattingly spent five days orbiting the moon, and then we spent uh, one day uh, in orbit, then three days on the moon, or 72 hours, and then uh, three days, uh, one day uh, in orbit on the way home. 
A day on the moon uh, is from sunrise to sunset is two weeks. So on the moon, you're always in daylight. The sun, the sunset on the moon, it gets really, really cold, and your suits, things don't work in that uh, absolute zero. So you had to be off uh, before 250 degrees Fahrenheit. And we lifted off, it was like 230 Fahrenheit when we left the moon. Okay, uh, let's see, one up in the, we have anybody up in the balcony? Okay, go ahead. Uh, if you can go back to the moon, would you? Yo, yeah, would I go back? I think everybody heard that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I was uh, ready to go the day I got back. And uh, that's why I said, that's why I volunteered for Apollo uh, 17 backup. You know, you might get to go again. It was really exciting, great adventure. Uh, everybody wanted to go again. And some people didn't get to go at all. So uh, it was uh, uh, a, a great experience and I was really honored and humbled that I got picked. I don't know how I got selected, but I did. And uh, so we did a, uh, try to do a good job. Okay, over here on this side. Next question. General Duke, I wanted to thank you for your service. Thank and you, I, sir. And I wanted to ask. Thank you. Yeah. Less than 1% of Americans serve in the military, so thank you. Now, that being said, how was walking on the moon, how did that change you from a spiritual way? Uh, the Apollo, uh, you want to... The, the question was, how did it change you from a, from a spiritual perspective? Uh, it was not a spiritual experience for me. Uh, I did not feel close to God. Uh, I, I, to me, I was too focused operationally. Uh, there were some astronauts that uh, had a, a, a spiritual experience. Jim, Jim Irwin, Apollo 15, quoted scripture. Uh, from He was a committed Christian when he went. Uh, uh, Buzz Aldrin had communion on Apollo 11 uh, 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 when he was an elder in the Presbyterian Church when he went. Uh, and then I said, told about Apollo, uh, uh, Apollo 8. Uh, those guys uh, were godly. Uh, and uh, so they read from Scripture. Uh, my conversion, I, I believed in God. And God was out there somewhere. And I honored God on Sunday, but it was just a Sunday ritual for me. Uh, it, wasn't, it was head knowledge, not heart knowledge. And so after Apollo, uh, I was 36 years old and said, well, what are you going to do now with the rest of your life? Pretty hard to top a flight to the moon. And, uh, <laughs> so I was, uh, worked on space shuttle. To make a long story short, we almost divorced. My wife was on really sad shape uh, emotionally, uh, but some people came to our church and they were on fire for the Lord and glowed with the love and the joy of, of uh, Jesus. And she said, if that's real, I want it. If not, I'm ready to die. And two months later, she changed from sadness to joy. And uh, then, <laughs> praise God. And then, uh, then two year, two and a, that was about October of the 75. Two and a half years later, uh, a friend of mine invited me to a Bible study at TBRM, and the same thing happened to me. It's a long story, but uh, sitting in the front seat of my automobile, I realized I had a choice, either stop playing church or commit, and say, Lord, I commit, come into my life, and I started to change. And so we've been walking with God now it's for uh, uh, 40 48 years, let's see, 1978, uh, so a little over 48 years, and uh, is that right? Yeah, okay, uh, 78, no, uh, 40 years, I'm sorry. My ma I'm a slow on math. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, by the way, we, we have some books out, are gonna be some books out back, uh, books we, I wrote called Moonwalker, and uh, actually Dottie wrote it, but it was my story, and the last chapters are about our, our fate. So if you want more detail, uh, get one of those books. Okay, one more. We'll take two more, one question here and then one in the, bal the balcony. Go ahead. Yeah.
What kind of rocks did you find on the moon? What kind of rocks did we find on the moon? Well, uh, our rocks were different than the Maori rocks. Uh, they were, uh, the Maori, where Neil Armstrong landed, were mostly volcanic. The dark areas on the moon are volcanic. Uh, we picked up a lot of brecherous, not very many inclusions of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of volcanic rock. Uh, and we had uh, other rocks that were uh, uh, igneous rocks that they cooled quicker uh, than, uh, uh, slower I should say, and they weren't volcanic. Uh, and uh, to be honest, I've forgotten all the mineral compositions of them. Uh, but if you really are interested, all that's on the web now. Uh, and so you can read anything about Apollo that you want. And uh, every landing is documented. Uh, and so uh, we really did land on the moon, folks. <laughs> Okay, one more. What was your favorite thing to do on the way to the moon? What was my favorite? What was your favorite thing to do on your way to the moon? Uh, my favorite thing to get, well, uh, we had a lot of experiments. Uh, going to the moon was uh, just waiting to get there, really. You, we had some experiments to do. Uh, we had a light flash. Uh, experiment. Uh, we were seeing when you get outside the Van Allen belts especially, which is 22,000 miles away, you start seeing these look like flash bulbs going off in your eyeballs and uh, or streaks and and uh, we called them light flashes. So by the time we flew we had an experiment and that was probably the favorite thing. I put this thing on it was like horse blinders uh, and two photo photographic plates, one was still and the other moved slowly. And so when I fired it up, uh, I sat there and just concentrated. Oh, there's one, upper right, uh, uh, upper left to lower right. You could see the direction as it went through your eyeball. And, uh, and if, if it came straight on, it was like a flash bulb. And that was a really interesting experiment. It turned out there were cosmic radiation. Uh, so uh, deep space, uh, is going to be uh, need radiation uh, protection to Mars. Uh, 11 days on the moon or two months on the moon, I don't think you're going to have a problem. Uh, so, but, uh, so that experiment was real interesting to do. Uh, the uh, most thing we didn't want, that, that had the, not most trouble with, but the, uh, the, the most uh, unusual and uh, was the waste management system. And <laughs> on Apollo, it was not a triumph of technology. Uh, <laughs> they gave you a bag, and, uh, and so uh, you, uh, like this, and uh, you had to get it, to get it in the right position. Uh, unfortunately, in zero gravity, nothing goes to the bottom of the bag. <laughs> and with that, I'll say good night. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.